In 200 AD, St. Clement of Alexandria wrote his book, The Stromata. In it, he writes, The mysteries of the faith are not to be divulged to all. It is requisite to hide in a mystery the wisdom spoken, which the Son of God taught. Here, St. Clement is pointing towards the topic of our course, esoteric Christianity. The word esoteric has the root eso, which means interior or within, and esoteric, coming from the Greek word esoterikos, means something intended to be revealed only to the initiates of a certain group, something understood or meant for only the select few who have a special knowledge or interest. Saint Clement is telling us that there are mysteries within the Christian doctrine, and they're not normally exposed unless you've had some type of special teaching. And we can find within the New Testament what Jesus states about the mysteries. In Matthew 13, it's written, And the disciples came and said to him, Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Normally, Everybody seems to think that these mysteries are exposed by some simple reading of the Bible. But actually, the word itself, mystery, mysterion in Greek, means something secret. Mystery means something of which initiation is necessary, something related to a secret doctrine. It comes from the mustis the word mustes, meaning one who is initiated. So St. Clement is telling us that there are those who are initiated and they can understand the mysteries. And Jesus is saying that there are some who are initiated into his teachings and they understand the mysteries. But for those who are not initiated, what they understand is something else. They understand it at their own level. This is the power of the parable. In fact, the full quote of St. Clement is as follows. The mysteries of the faith are not to be divulged to all. But since this tradition is not published alone for him who perceives the magnificence of the world, it is requisite, therefore, to hide in a mystery the wisdom spoken which the Son of God taught. In other words, there are different types of people, some who are ready, some who perceive the true magnificence of the world. This is him alluding to the initiates, those who are initiated into that mystery, into understanding the esoteric Christianity. And for those who are not ready, they understand a lesser teaching, a teaching that is more appropriate for them. If we go to the Old Testament, which of course is the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament is the Torah of Judaism, the mystical commentary of the Zohar writes, all matters in the Torah or of a superior nature, and our uppermost secrets. Woe to those wicked who say that the Torah is merely a story and nothing more, for they look at the dress and no further. So the mysterious, initiated, or esoteric doctrine of Christianity finds its roots in the Old Testament, which also has an esoteric doctrine. St. Paul in the 1 Corinthians 3 says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you 
as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food or meat, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. During this time, it was very important to keep those who are not prepared for the esoteric doctrine, to give them a teaching which would help prepare them. And for those who were prepared, it was very important to give them that same inner esoteric doctrine that we have been speaking about. The very beautiful nature of the Bible and many other scriptures is that both of those teachings are within the same books, within the same scriptures. And as Jesus states, those who have ears to hear it and eyes to see it, they see the level of the teaching which they can comprehend. And as Paul states, some are not ready for the meat. They're not ready for the solid food. They're ready for the milk. So this is the way it has been for a long time. Unfortunately, the modern forms of Christianity that are very popular and prevalent deny an esoteric aspect to Christianity. And just as the Zohar has stated, what happens is that they inherit only the cloak, only the outer dress of the teachings, which are good for a certain level, but they never have, or somehow, through some series of events, lost the inner doctrine, the esoteric doctrine, the esoteric form of Christianity. Without the esoteric level of the teachings, the tradition as a whole suffers an incoherence. If you literally read the Bible, you'll find all sorts of contradictions. For someone who critically analyzes that, if there's no inner teaching, then all that can be seen is something that contradicts itself or something that appears superficial. And this is a main reason why many people have left their traditional religion because they only can find the lower level, the milk, and they are ready to receive the solid food, the meat. There are good legitimate reasons to have an inner doctrine. But today, things have obviously changed quite a bit from 2,000 years ago. Today, we see we live in an age of information. For today, it is more important to set that information correct. Because not everybody who states that they have the inner teachings legitimately has them. So we need to clarify exactly what this esoteric Christianity is. And that's the purpose of this course. We must come to recognize an esoteric Christianity has existed and that such an esoteric Christianity must exist. As we have said, different types of people exist and we need to have a type of doctrine available for all of those types of people. And there are many people today who view the way that the Bible is taught as something very simplistic and incoherent and not substantial. And thus people end up leaving the religion because they don't find a level of guidance which they're appropriate for. And this is how many people end up looking for something deeper. And indeed, there is an esoteric Christianity. For us, it's not a debate. It's not a question. It's a living reality. With that being said, let us make some differentiations between the exoteric or outer traditional forms of Christianity, as it's normally known, and the esoteric Christianity. In traditional forms of Christianity, there is the doctrine of justification 
which is the removing of our guilt and the penalty of sin and making the sinner righteous again. The core idea is that the life of Jesus Christ atoned for all the sins of the world. And through either faith alone, if you're a Protestant, or good works based upon faith, this justification is accomplished. And there is a substitutionary atonement that the life and works, the drama of Jesus Christ, made that atonement because he died on the cross. The sins of all of us are washed away. This is viewed in the exoteric way as a historical fact. But from the inner esoteric Christianity, all of this must be understood as something happening within our heart and mind, within our soul and spirit. That Jesus Christ indeed was a person of great exaltation who provides the teaching in the way, but the events of the New Testament aren't merely a historical recounting, that those events of the New Testament are pointing towards spiritual realities that must occur within ourself and that all of the characters of the Bible are related to certain aspects within ourself. In esoteric Christianity, what is meant by the world is our own inner world. So Jesus, this master of history, this historical master, is teaching about the inner Jesus Christ, which is an element of or a principle within ourselves. That principle must come into our world in order to wash away all of our mistakes. And we play an active part of that. This is something we must perform, something we must do. And it is a path of intense struggle and profound works within ourselves. And through those works, we are able to know and comprehend the nature of divinity. In traditional exoteric forms of Christianity, inquiring within oneself to discover and fundamentally change one's inner condition to eliminate all of the sins of our mind and our heart, this is seen as something impossible for the individual to do. Instead, one must simply do good works or have a faith in a belief, and whatever needs to happen within oneself will happen. The esoteric aspect, esoteric teaching, states that we actually have to make an active effort to look within ourselves, to transform ourselves, and we do that only through the cooperation of the Lord that we have a spark of inner divinity within ourselves that allows us to work within ourselves, that we are capable of making these transformations within ourselves because the Lord is cooperating, that there is an aspect, a spark of divinity within ourselves that connects us to the universal cosmic force called Christ and therefore, we must do this work. We must find that connection within ourselves. This is what esoteric Christianity is always pointing towards. From a traditional exoteric Christian perspective, it is seen that the individual is not capable of radically transforming their self, and that actually the mind is a type of den of thieves that one should not dwell within one's mind too much, that it is the devil's playground. From an esoteric standpoint, we agree that the mind is a den of thieves and that it is the devil's playground, but it is precisely for that reason that we must begin to pay attention to all of that which is happening within ourself and through the cooperation of Christ through the capability 
of that divine spark of divinity which we have, we are able to develop and grow and multiply the light within ourselves. We are capable of eliminating all of that which is not the truth, all of the lying, sinning qualities of our mind. And what comes forth is light and consciousness and universal compassion and all of the beautiful qualities that we strive for. Exoteric Christianity teaches a lot of very good things, a lot of very necessary things about how to live a good life, how to produce a stable life, how to live in this world. But it does not teach or does not even permit, in most cases, the inner working, the development of one's own soul within. It does not view that the soul is something that must be develop. And this is one of the primary differences between exoteric Christianity and esoteric Christianity. Esoteric Christianity views the soul as something that must be worked with, that we must develop our soul, and that our works and our efforts are very necessary. It's not that one can, through their own egotistical will, find salvation. No. But it is necessary for us to do good works. It is necessary to transform our state of mind through a contemplative lifestyle. To transform ourselves through the power and glory of God. The efforts that take place within esoteric Christianity are impossible without God. But unlike the traditional forms of Christianity, we must learn in esoteric Christianity to work upon ourself, to inquire within our mind, to eliminate our, our defects. And our side of the work is just as important as God's side of the work. In esoteric Christianity, it is understood that we can, under, that we can know and experience God directly. This is one of the main differences. In the traditional forms of Christianity, God can only be understood or experienced through the conduit of the church. In terms of exoteric Christianity, God can only be understood within the confines of the church. That the church and the consecrated priests and bishops and cardinals are the conduit from God to man that special church, and there's a physical exponent. And different churches believe that they are the one and holy and only church of that. And a Protestant viewpoint is that what you need is the true and right and correct belief, and then that is the conduit or the pathway to salvation. Esoteric Christianity states that we must come to know God. Not only can we know God directly, not only can we comprehend the nature of God, but moreover, we must do that. That is the whole point of esoteric Christianity, is to fully develop the soul. The full development of the soul is possible. Christ enters into the soul that has been completely purified and developed. So from the traditional exoteric forms of Christianity, Christ is seen as a person of history. Someone who came and who is still in heaven, still active, but a particular event happened in history. And believing in that is what's most important. But in esoteric Christianity, what is important is to incarnate Christ. Because in esoteric Christianity, Christ is not a person. Christ is an energy. Jesus, who we call Christ. Jesus was a particular spiritual master. Jesus was a real, true rabbi. And he purified his soul to such a degree 
that the Christ incarnated within him, and he taught that. And when he spoke, literally, he was speaking the words of Christ. And what is Christ? Christ comes from a Greek word, Christos. And Christos means one who is anointed, meaning anointed with an oil. Christ, from an esoteric standpoint, means fire. And Christ, from an esoteric standpoint, is a title. It's not a personal name. Christ is not a person. So Jesus was and is a person who acquired or incarnated this universal fire, this universal force, this universal light, which is Christ. In Luke 12, it's written, I am come to send fire on the earth. This is the mission of Christ. In esoteric Christianity, all of the events of the Bible need to be understood as something within. In traditional Christianity, all of those events took place literally outside in the world. But really, all of those events were all parables. There really is no literal historical truth in the Bible. There is certain events that occurred in the past, and those who are initiated into these teachings would take the literal events and mingle them with esoteric truths, with profound truths, and they would display and write down a history that would give a meaning for those who are not initiated, a very good meaning that was often related with physical truths, but never the literal truth. The Bible never has been a newspaper, and it should not be read like a newspaper. It should be read in terms of parables, in terms of spiritual teachings and truths. And if you understand it at a certain level, it teaches you how to live in the world in a very good way. And if you understand it at the esoteric level, it teaches you how to transform your soul and how to acquire all the powers, all the cognizance, all the wisdom, all of the compassion, all of the beauty and the glory of the soul. This is what we are called to do. This is the esoteric path of Christianity. We find in Luke chapter 11, Woe unto you, knowers of the law, which is the Torah, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. So the knowers of the law have taken away the key of knowledge. Knowledge in the original language is gnosis. So gnosis is written in Greek, which is gamma, nu, omega, sigma, iota, sigma, which in English letters you can transliterate as G-N-O-S-I-S, gnosis. Gnosis is knowledge. And what tends to happen, and what Jesus was speaking about, was that these esoteric teachings become lost for various reasons. And Jesus states that those who knew these teachings were not giving them properly. They were holding on to them too jealously. And they themselves were not living those inner teachings. And they were not teaching others. So he said, Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering, ye hindered. Gnosis is a word that has been used by a lot of different groups. And it is where we get the word Gnostic. There has been a lot said about Gnostics. It's very difficult to understand, based on what has been written about Gnostics, to really understand what Gnosticism actually is. Unfortunately, there's a lot of groups, ancient and modern, who state that they're Gnostic, but really they are not. They really don't have these teachings, or they have perverted them. They have degenerated them. And there are others who wrote about the Gnostics 
again, ancient and contemporary, who never understood the secret knowledge. They were never initiated into the secret teachings. So they could not tell the difference between those Gnostics which were really degenerated and those Gnostics were, that were actually holding up the mantle of the true esoteric teachings. So all of the writings about Gnostics, it's very difficult to get some clear understanding. And a lot of people have a very negative connotation concerning the Gnostics. But here we can see that a Gnostic is someone who has Gnosis. And Gnosis is knowledge, spiritual knowledge. That's the true meaning. In accordance with esoteric Christianity, Jesus was born in a sect called the Essenes, which was an esoteric sect of Judaism. And from there, he was initiated into the mysteries. And of course, many other things happened during all of those years which are not accounted for in the Bible. And when he came to teach, he came to teach a very profound teaching. And many people were not agreeable to that which is why there is all of the drama that's going on. We have to understand the New Testament as types of events that are occurring within our heart and within our mind. Because when these teachings come into ourselves and we try to change, we try to become perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. It is very difficult. There are aspects of our self which don't want to change. There are aspects of ourselves, which is like a tyrant that doesn't want to hear these things, that doesn't want to change, that it just wants to do whatever it wants to do. This is our ego. The ego is our personal Satan. So not only is all of the characters, all the prophets, all the teachers of the Bible related to some spiritual elements within ourselves. But all of the negative things that are in the Bible are also related to negative aspects within ourselves. So Satan is within ourselves, And we have to work to eliminate Satan. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul writes, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Obviously, Paul was initiated into these teachings. Paul knew the esoteric doctrine. There are many people who only want to associate uh, the word Gnostic with a particular time frame. But really, the best way to understand what is a Gnostic is it is someone who has the esoteric teachings, because the word Gnostic comes from Gnosis, and Gnosis means that hidden knowledge. So Paul legitimately was a Gnostic. The original church that was founded by Jesus had the esoteric teachings. So it was a Gnostic Catholic church, a true universal church, that's what the word Catholic actually means, is something that is universal. So the universal knowledge, the universal knowledge that is within ourself that can set us free. Because as it is stated, the truth shall set us free. But we have to come to know that truth within ourself. So the secret teachings are pointing towards a secret truth which is within ourself. And we have to discover the truth within ourself. But that truth is obscured. It is hidden. It is difficult to access. And in order to access that truth, you have to begin to live life in a certain way. You have to do certain types of practices. Because any type of real Gnostic, anybody who is truly living esoterically, the Christian doctrine. This person is a contemplative. This is a person who is meditating, going within, 
Many people believe that meditation is only uh, something that belongs to the East. But of course, this is wrong. Anybody who has studied the Philokalia or the Christian Desert Fathers would know that there is tremendous wisdom relating to meditation in a Christian sense. And we need to learn how to do that because then we come to know ourselves. And that knowledge of oneself is that gnosis. This is the key that unlocks the truth within ourself and sets us free. As we can see in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul states that we speak a wisdom among them that are perfect. Perfect is teleos, and those that are perfect are those that are like Jesus Christ. And the the wisdom of those that are perfect are, is not the wisdom of this world. It's not the exoteric, literal, historical wisdom of this world. Nor is it of the princes of this world or all the leaders of this world, which have which come to nothing because everything passes away. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom. So all of us must endeavor to reach this stage of perfection. The one who achieves that stage of perfection has truly transcended this current state. And this is what esoteric Christianity is saying is possible. Esoteric Christianity is not just another set of beliefs. It's not just another set of philosophical musings or a different cosmology or a different way of understanding the creation of the universe. All of those things may be different in terms of esoteric Christianity. We can say things and speak at more depth in relationship to the origin of the universe and the philosophical epistemological views of, of the, the way that we experience life and all sorts of philosophical things. But none of that matters if we fail to live the actual lifestyle, which is to inquire within ourselves. And when, when we begin to hold ourselves accountable for all of the activity of our minds and hearts, then we are becoming ready to engage, to hear, we become ready to accept the esoteric teachings. So long as we are blaming others, so long as that we continue to believe that there is nothing that can be done to change our inner self, then we are not ready. We'll end this lecture with a couple of quotes from Samael Aon Veor. In order to understand the Bible, one needs to be a Gnostic because the Bible is a highly symbolic book, and if we try to read it in the Protestant style, like one who reads newspaper columns, we fall into the most terrible absurdities. In truth, if we read the Bible literally, it doesn't make any sense. And this is enough proof to state that the literal interpretations of the Bible are incoherent, and our final quote, These are the mysteries of the Gospels that must be lived here and now within ourselves. The life, passion, and death of our Lord Jesus Christ is not something that is strictly historic as people believe. It is something of an immediate actuality that each one must perform in his or her laboratory. This is what the crude reality of Christ is. It is not something from the history of the past that occurred 2,000 years ago. It is something to be lived here and now. In this lecture, we have only just begun to scratch the surface. We have not yet actually talked about what this esoteric teaching is. We have simply stated that such a teaching exists. In our following lectures, we will begin to teach the actual ways of understanding the Bible in order to live in accordance with esoteric Christianity.